Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thanks for coming back again. If you've been to some of our previous seminars this quarter, um, and if you're new, we're happy to have you here. Um, again, welcome to the UC Santa Barbara Natural Reserve System Virtual Seminar Series. This is our second annual, and um, we are, again, just so pleased to have you here with us. This seminar series aims to take you on a virtual tour of UCSB's seven magical reserves um, to get a look at all of the scientific and educational endeavors that occur here. And so what are reserves and what happens at reserves? Well, the UCSB Natural Reserve System is part of an overall system in the University of California. Um, and each UC campus manages a handful of reserves. We here at UCSB manage seven and there's 41 overall. Um, at our reserves, um, these are special places. They're lands protected for research, university level education, and public service. And so there's just a wide variety of activities going on that hopefully help inform um, what we need to know about the environment today and, and tomorrow as well. Tonight, we have a really special treat for you. I know you're going to be excited to hear our speaker, Doc, Dr. Matthew Shapiro, and also our introduction provided by Kate McCurdy, who's the director of Cedric Reserve. Before we get started, I wanted to just um, take care of a few uh, you know, housekeeping and logistics and talk about the format for tonight. We're going to get started with a 15 minute um, presentation by Kate McCurdy, and she's going to tell us all about what's going on at Cedric Reserve. And then she'll introduce our speaker, Dr. Matthew Shapiro, um, who will speak uh, for 30 minutes or so. After Matthew's finished, then uh, we're going to get into a Q&A session, and that's um, your chance out there in the audience to interact with our, our speaker, both of our speakers, Kate and Matthew. And when you do that, um, please use the Q&A button that's down at the right hand side of your screen. Um, you can type in your questions there, and I promise I'll try to get to as many of them as we can. I will be the moderator for the Q&A session, and again, please submit your questions for either Kate or for Matthew tonight. Um, just to note that this will be recorded, and um, if you're unable to catch the whole thing tonight, or if you want to share this with anybody tomorrow, um, it'll be up on the UCSB Natural Reserve System YouTube page, along with all of the other lectures that have been presented this season. Uh, and so without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Kate, and why don't you take it away from here? Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Give me a second to, um, to get my screen in order here. Is that uh, looking okay, Marianne? Great. Looks great. All right. Thanks, uh, Marianne, for organizing this like super awesome event and lecture series, two years running. It's been a really fun way for us to learn about what's going on in other reserves in addition to our own. So um, that has been fantastic. And uh, welcome everyone, even you Astro fans. Um, I'm gonna start off by telling you a little bit about Sedgwick um, and its history and some things that are going on. And um, we'll just dive right in with a little orientation of Sedgwick for those of you who maybe haven't been here yet. Um, Sedgwick is located in Santa Barbara County about 30 miles northwest of the UCSB campus in the Santa Inez Valley. Uh, on this map, we are the turquoise t-shirt looking property that's tucked up next to the Los Padres National Forest, um, which is the dark, sort of darker green up there. Um, the forest itself is over 3000 square miles. A lot of it is wilderness. And uh, we are one of the largest reserves in the system at just under 6,000 acres which translates to about nine square miles. Uh, for those of you who work best with landmarks, we're bordered to the north by Midland School and Grass Mountain. We're bordered to the east by Figueroa Mountain, uh, to the west by the Brattlewood uh, Winery, and to the south, Pink, the Rockstars Ranch. Uh, as Marianne pointed out, Sedgwick is one of the seven reserves managed by UC Santa Barbara. Uh, you can see the arrow pointing to us. We, we wear jersey number 35. 
Um, and we work with uh, a network of other UCNRS sites managed by other campuses that we share something in common with, such as uh, serpentine soils or multi-reserve research projects or land management issues, such as reserves that have cattle. Um, and you'll notice just from the proximity of the other reserves that are listed there and, and circled in red, that most of our sister reserves tend to be inland, foothill, oak woodland sites. Uh, prior to this becoming a UC owned natural reserve, the land has uh, been seeped in cultural history. The Chumash are the indigenous people who inhabited the central and southern coastal regions of California. Among the 14 bands of Chumash, the Samala or San Inez Chumash flourished in the San Inez Valley and occupied at least one known village site on land that is now managed um, as Sedgwick Reserve. So wish to acknowledge the Chumash. Uh, the Chumash maintained villages in across the San Inez Valley. Um, towards our end of the valley, they, their camps were, villages were used seasonally for hunting and, and gathering. Despite that they teamed uh, with grizzly bears and mountain lions, those proved to be less daunting than Octavio Gutierrez, who received the land as part of a 48,000 acre uh, Mexican land ground in 1845. Um, that land stretched from the Eastern San Inez Valley to what is now the town of Los Alamos. So the land that is now Sedgwick was bought and sold a few times in the century between 1850 and when the Sedgwick family uh, bought the ranch in 1952. Uh, they changed the name from Rancho La Laguna de San Francisco to the Sedgwick Ranch. Um, so cattle have been grazing on Sedgwick for, um, boy, since the eight, mid 1800s. Uh, the Sedgwicks were known as gentlemen ranchers, which as far as I can tell means they uh, enjoyed ranching and didn't really need the money from selling beef. Um, the Sedgwick family donated a majority of the property, about 87% of the land to the university in 1967. And the remaining 13% of the property was purchased by the Santa Barbara Land Trust and given to UC Santa Barbara in 1997. Um, and that's the year it was brought into the natural reserve system. So researchers from UCSB and beyond have been adding to this treasure map ever since. Since the ranch became a reserve in 1997, a whole lot of people have been striving to put Sedgwick on the map uh, by equally partitioning our use between the forearms of the UC, mission, UC and the UCNRS mission, which is like Marianne um, said earlier, research, education, outreach, and land stewardship. So our facilities are located on a roughly 10 acre field station uh, that consists of uh, researcher housing, a campground, office space, a maintenance yard, and several staff residences. We host about 7,000 visitors a year. Um, although that wasn't true in COVID, it will be true um, starting in 2022, is my guess. Um, and our facilities provide overnight accommodations to about 600 users who stay on average for two nights every year. Uh, over the past 15 years, the old ranch buildings uh, have either been renovated or replaced with energy and water, uh, energy efficient and water conservation in mind. Six of our seven buildings meet lead gold standards and um, solar arrays produce about half of our electrical demand. Our seventh building where we have offices uh, and hold academic meetings, classes and workshops is a much coveted platinum lead rated building known as the Tipton Meeting House um, shown here. And we hope to get back to in-person use of this building again in 2022. It's been largely um, unoccupied for the past year and a half. We'd like to get it back before the spiders um, completely take it over. Uh, those of you who have been to Sedgwick know that the ranch house is the cornerstone of our facilities. It was renovated in 2017, thanks to the generosity of um, 
our best benefactor ever, Linda Dutton Haver and, and uh, her father, Morton McCretz. Uh, and the ranch house is so, so nice now that researchers who stay there have renamed uh, us the Cedric Resort. Uh, this is a, order, a photo of the Northern Porch where the Lacretz director has an office, living quarters and collaborative workspace, uh, facilities that were completed in, in 2019. Uh, this is one of our newest facilities, a six person bunkhouse that was completed in 2020. Um, also, during the past two years of the pandemic, we made some uh, greatly needed improvements to the campground area and the, the patio that uh, has a pavilion on it now. It used to be the Sedgwick pool. Some of you might remember um, getting to swim in that pool. Um, we're just happy to have the shade, although granted a, a pool would be nice. Um, but this space is really um, important and can now better accommodate university sized classes and, and large groups. Um, I took these pictures uh, just today of a class camping here. And um, I just love this photo of the lawn chair <laughs> office set up with a beautiful view and, and also has some Wi Fi. <laughs> Uh, as you can imagine, we spend a lot of time and energy keeping a re reserve of this size uh, functional. Um, most important to our users is that our video link internet and Wi-Fi are always working. Um, but our Sedgwick stewards maintain over 20 miles of unpaved roads and devote hundreds, hundreds of hours every year uh, doing vegetation management and keeping our facilities safe from fire, time, rodents, and um, the harsh, harsh elements. Um, Sedgwick has been incredibly fortunate to have donor support um, much needed to overhaul the Sedgwick's old ranch buildings and turn the ranch into a high functioning biological field station. Um, our charge now is to maintain these buildings and lessen our impact on non-renewable energy sources. So we are, um, looking for ways always to improve our energy efficiency and, and add to our, our photovoltaic systems. Uh, Sedgwick is one of the few UC natural reserves in the state of California that maintains a herd of cattle to help with vegetation management, um, to reduce fire fuels. Um, it's the topic of tonight's talk, so I won't steal any of Matthew's uh, thunder, except to ask, does this photo not pose an interesting question about who is studying who? Um, every year we have a cadre of uh, at least 50 docents and volunteers that contribute uh, over 700 days of service in support of research, stewardship, and outreach at Sedgwick. Uh, their contributions are critical to Sedgwick's operation. They do everything from leading hikes to clearing up old fence, and uh, they always do it with a smile. So if you haven't already, please subscribe to our mailing list and learn more about upcoming hikes, events, and ways uh, that you too can get involved and, and volunteer to help us keep Sedgwick uh, running smoothly. So on any given year, Sedgwick hosts between 30 and 60 research projects, um, wide range of emphasis, but native grasslands, population genetics, uh, plant competition, climate change, soil microbiology, uh, animal behavior, uh, it's, a, it's a long list. And about 90% of the research conducted at Sedgwick is UC affiliated. Uh, we are also especially fortunate to have an embedded research center the Lacretz Research Center at Cedric Reserve. Um, it's now heading into its fifth year, the Lacretz Center under the directorship of Frank Davis has enabled uh, talented graduate students and early career scientists to conduct new research on the reserve. Uh, just one of these projects currently moving from the planning stages into reality is the NASA Pathfinder pilot study that will be conducted as a collaboration between NASA, the Nature Conservancy at Dangerman Preserve and uh, the Lacrette Center researchers. <clears throat> they will use uh, cameras fitted on high elevation uh, Avaris air flights to study plant biodiversity. Uh, another collaborative effort is the Lacrette's long-term research program on fire management in foothill landscapes. 
uh, which received seed funding from Linda Duttenhaver to launch in 2020. Um, just one element of this study is looking at cattle and the role of cattle grazing in making urban and rural interfaces safer from fire. It's the topic uh, Matthew will be speaking more about this evening. And I personally have been fortunate to be able to work with a terrestrial ecologists from uh, UCSB Young Lab who are focusing on wildlife and disease ecology in the reserve's coastal sage scrub environment. We have cameras out in the southwest corner to collect data on what species are using coastal sage scrub before and after prescribed burns. And I have to tell you, it's been so impressive to see the diversity of wildlife stepping, um, stepping right up to get their pictures taken. And uh, I put in just a few of the recent ones. There's a fox, mountain lion, black bear, and my favorite one of all is a little stinker. Uh, the last project I'm going to highlight is the Sundowner Winds Experiment, otherwise known as SWEX. You might have heard of this um, in the past two years. It's been put on hold because of the pandemic. Uh, but it's another collaboration between the Carvalho Lab at UCSB and the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, we're really looking forward to it launching uh, next April. And the goals of the study are to teach undergraduate students how to study atmospheric science in the field and to develop ways to predict when sundowner winds uh, will occur in Santa Barbara County. So lastly, I wanna to touch on class use of Cedric, which, uh, which accounts for about a quarter of our overall use. Uh, we'd like to see more classes and more students at Cedric. Um, it's our goal now that pandemic restrictions are lifting to um, try and increase our class use, uh, maybe double it in future years now that we have better facilities for them. Um, and we want to encourage not just bio majors, but also literature, art, music, ethnic study classes to come and study and, and learn in nature. So uh, just a short video uh, describing the value of field-based learning as part of the University of California undergraduate experience. It's really important that students learn outside. Being able to host the field studies class has really been fulfilled a, a main objective of mine in the past 10 years. Also just personally rewarding to see students like fall in love with this place. California Ecology and Conservation is a course where we take 25 to 30 students from across the different UC campuses on a 50 day circuit of natural reserves around the state where in total we, we visit between six and eight reserves each term. So here at Sedgwick, we are looking at oak seed dispersal. So we're studying acorn preference in two different species of birds to see where they cache them and which ones they prefer. These are acorn woodpecker caches, and we've been climbing up on a ladder, pulling out every fifth acorn and checking it out based on size and health. Being here at Sedgwick has been so inspirational and definitely um, has inspired me to pursue a career in conservation. I think that science has an increasingly important role to play in society. And I don't want or expect all the students that come through this course to go into science, to go to graduate school, to go into scientific careers. I want and expect all the students to come through this course to leave this course fluent in, in the process of science, to understand fully what, what science means, what science is, what it represents. All right. Uh, well, thank you for allowing me to share the Cedric story with you. Um, I hope it excited you to visit Cedric as much as we love living and working here. But now on to uh, the main event. For those of you who tuned into last week's seminar, I think you'll recognize Matthew Shapiro to be the Joe Cutler of the coastal rangelands. Enthusiastic, knowledgeable, and really excited to be working in the field. Um, he's the one in the top photo. The bottom photo is to remind me to remind you that if you have a question uh, to ask during Matthew's talk, just pop your hand up in the Q&A and uh, we'll try and get an answer during or after the talk. So I am pleased and honored to introduce our speaker tonight, Matthew Shapiro. Matthew works for another arm of the University of California, the Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources, serving as the Livestock and Range Advisor for Santa Barbara and, and Ventura counties. Before starting as advisor in our region just over four years ago, Matthew worked for the Rangeland Planning and Policy and the Rangeland Ecology Labs at the University of California, Berkeley. 
So thank you, Matthew. Thank you for sharing uh, some of what you know that you've mastered at Cedric. And uh, now I'm turning it over to you. Good evening. Thank you, Kate, for such a warm welcome. I will get my screen going. It, it really is a pleasure and an honor to uh, be with you all this evening. Um, I typically like to start these talks uh, with a brief explanation of what cooperative extension is. Cooperative extension is part of that division of agriculture and natural resources that Kate just mentioned. And really simply put, it is um, a wing of the university that is over a century old and the primary purpose uh, is to uh, take knowledge and, resource and research that uh, is generated on UC campuses and to communicate or extend uh, that information out to Californians and the general public. Um, I am a UC academic. My appointment is uh, county-based as opposed to campus-based. And my discipline, as Kate mentioned, is as a livestock and range advisor, which means that uh, generally speaking, I, I work with ranchers and livestock operators and also other uh, public and private owners of rangeland. I've been asked uh, this evening to share uh, work and research that I've been conducting over the last couple of years, looking at the intersection of uh, fire and grazing. And you will have to forgive the early and pretty bad pun about burning questions. But uh, I th the point is really to emphasize that I think that there really are some outstanding and certainly urgent questions around this intersection of grazing and wildfire. Uh, by no means this evening do I think that uh, we will answer them all, in fact, maybe not any of them. But I'm hoping that at the very least that I can provide those of us uh, on the seminar this evening with kind of a framework to think about, to better think about uh, how, we might, um, how we might think about and the questions that we might ask around this intersection. Um, before going much further, I want to do two things. The first is really to acknowledge that the research that I'm about to share has been produced um, entirely in collaboration. Um, there is a large suite and team of researchers and staff members who have assisted and been part of the execution and the analysis of this work. And I really want to emphasize and acknowledge their role in participating. And this, the second piece that I want to emphasize, especially since this is a seminar sort of um, celebrating the NRS system, is that so much of this work that I'm about to describe could not have been done uh, without the support of Cedric Reserve and the Lecrette Center. Um, both sort of the, the physical circumstances, the staff support, and, uh, and really the, the brain power that exists at Sedgwick has been indispensable in executing a lot of what I'm about to talk about. I think that there are so many of us here this evening because in recent years, wildfire has just become increasingly uh, a, a figment of our, uh, of our lives, a, a part of our lives. Um, whether that's because you've had fire insurance canceled on your home, uh, you have a friend or a relative who is a firefighter and has been away for weeks or months uh, fighting fire during recent wildfire seasons, uh, or maybe there's a rancher on tonight who's had to evacuate livestock or uh, perhaps even lost livestock. Um, this is my most recent uh, encounter with wildfire. Here I am standing on the western flank of the Alisol fire just a couple of weeks ago. Um, you can see, uh, or you were able to see in the distance there in the shrubland on the ridgeline, flames sort of licking over that ridgeline. And then here in the frozen screen, um, unburned pasture. Uh, um, I was standing on a ridgeline that looked much like the ones, one that, we were, that we're looking at now, um, grazed in my mind to an extent sufficient enough that I didn't think that fire would carry across this particular grassland uh, landscape. But in fact, just hours later, the direction of the wind shifted, the intensity increased and 
all the ground that you can see in the screen now um, by the next morning was burned over. That's not to say that all of the grazed grasslands that were within the Alisal fire perimeter burned, and, excuse me. In fact, I visited quite a number uh, of them that didn't, but just really to emphasize that, um, you know, this is an issue uh, which is pressing and, uh, and, and immediate. But of course, fire is not new uh, to California or to Santa Barbara County. Uh, we, here is the county uh, in white outline. And in red are all fire perimeters uh, that exist in the CAL FIRE database dating back to 1912. Highlighted here in yellow are what I might call large fires or fires over a thousand acres in size. And these are just the fires that have, that have occurred in the last 20 years. Many of these fires have become um, sort of household names, if you will. Looking at that database, there've been over 460 fires of all size since 1912. And a little less than a quarter of those fires are sort of these large fires uh, of over a thousand acres in size. Um, 21, I guess 22, if you count the Alisal fire, uh, of these fires have occurred just in the last 20 years. But of course, grazing is not new to California or to Santa Barbara County. And more specifically, grazing in the context of its capacity to potentially reduce the threat of wildfire. Here is a somewhat cheeky poster that CAL FIRE produced in the 1990s. This family could save your family, uh, it explains. And it sort of taps into what is kind of an obvious and if you will, intuitive point, which is that grazing fundamentally is the removal of fine herbaceous material, fine fuels. And when you remove fuels, you're necessarily gonna have fire burn less intensely or perhaps uh, even not at all. If you ask uh, your average rancher and certainly fire professionals, uh, they have likely all had experiences of seeing fire sort of cross landscapes and either stop or really meaningfully change in their fire behavior once they hit pastures that have been grazed. What's interesting though, is that this sort of obvious uh, notion or obvious knowledge exists really, really only as anecdote. Um, there's a surprising gap in the scientific literature uh, examining this issue, this intersection of, of grazing and fire. Here you see uh, two images from the one study, to my knowledge, that exists from California looking at grazing and fire. Uh, John Steckman from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo published this work in the early 80s based on, his, on work he did in the late 70s up in San Luis Obispo County. And the context for this study was, he was that he, he was looking at um, how to prevent fire from moving on to ranches, should you be a rancher. Um, so he looked at grazing, disking, burning, and mowing along the perimeter of your property to prevent wildfire from moving onto your land and burning your pastures. But all that to say that this is really all that exists, again, so far as I am aware, um, again, suggesting that there there's a really large gap, um, a, a gap of information when it comes to some really basic questions about wildfire and grazing. And so in the years of my career, the last uh, four years or so, I've been kicking around a couple of really basic questions that um, help me think about how we might frame some answers uh, to fill the gap in the literature that exists. And sort of most simply put, you know, how does grazing affect fire behavior? And here I'm thinking of grazing at different intensities and measuring fire behavior ac across a couple of important metrics. And then once fire has crossed through a, a landscape, what are the biophysical impacts of fire? Um, and, and especially the, how do those impacts change as the intensity of grazing changes as well? I'm specifically thinking of um, impacts to the soil seed bank. I'm thinking of uh, species composition the year following fire. And then in the livestock context, thinking about how forage production recovers post fire. And if, it, if you can begin to answer some of these questions, you might be able to pull out a little bit and think more broadly about how we might then apply grazing in strategic ways and in strategic locations across the landscape to lessen 
the threat of wildfire. And so it was with this sort of uh, basic suite of questions in my mind uh, that, uh, that I had when I was approached by a friend and colleague, Roxanne Foss, uh, who works for Volmar Natural Lands Consulting up in the Bay Area. And she had a notion for a project that uh, would have a statewide scope. And this was in 2018. It was subsequently funded by the Rustici uh, Cattle Endowment. And in 2019, we, we embarked upon a project um, that had a couple of characteristics. Specifically, we were looking at fire and grazing in the grassland vegetation type. For sure, uh, there's a, perhaps a different set and more complex set of questions in the shrubland type. But in this instance, in this instance we were looking just in grasslands. We were hoping to identify at, at a minimum nine sites where prescribed fires were planned, where we could then layer on uh, some manipulated biomass uh, plots, uh, manipulated biomass in an effort to simulate grazing at different intensities, light, moderate, and heavy grazing. And then as part of the prescribed burn, we would then be present to be able to measure some important fire, fire behavior metrics, which included how fast the fire moved, how high those flames got, and the temperature and intensity of the fire itself. And so here's an image of one of those nine sites. This is a site I set up uh, just this fall, actually in Santa Barbara County, um, just outside Los Alamos, and they're a little hard to see but there are four of what are typically six plots um, that are scattered throughout any one of these sites. And they're fairly small plots. They're six by 10 meters in size, but within them each are four treatments. Uh, one is a control and then those three grazing intensities that I mentioned. And it was back in 2019 when this project was initially funded that I first approached uh, Kate McCurdy and Frank Davis, uh, director of the LaCrette Center about Sedgwick potentially hosting one of these smaller sites. And I was quite pleased to discover that they had strong interest, not only in supporting the work that was affiliated with the Rostici grant, but to think about um, sort of meaningfully and dramatically expanding the effort uh, both literally and figuratively in terms of the scale of the treatment, but then also the intensity with which we were uh, planning to analyze the fire and grazing interaction. What has resulted has been not one, but two burns that we've been able to accomplish at Sedgwick, first in the fall of 2020, and then subsequently this last spring. Uh, we've dramatically, as I mentioned, dramatically expanded the scale. So we're not looking so much at plots that are six by 10 meters in size, but instead more like eight by 40 meters in size and replicated in a meaningful way across the landscape so that we're taking up a couple of acres in size that we're burning and measuring these plots. We're looking at the same, many of the same fire behavior metrics. So rate of spread, flame height and fire intensity. Um, we're also looking at it across different slope classes and, and then the benefit of being able to compare across seasons. So looking at fire both in the spring and fall and looking for differences or similarities. And then in addition to the sort of basic fire behavior metrics, we're able to, we've added a few other metrics, specifically uh, looking at pre and post fire vegetation composition and then potential impacts that fire has, uh, has on the soil seed bank. And then because of the, uh, the presence of Dr. Mark Mays as a project scientist with the LaCrette Center, we've been able to employ a really extensive drone effort using high resolution multispectral imagery, pre and post fire that has really um, enriched, I think, our analyses moving uh, forward. And so here's an image of what these plots look like at Sedgwick. You can see the T posts in the foreground uh, uh, scale, um, but again, you know, much larger plots than the statewide effort and uh, replicated across this landscape, both flat and sloped. Here's a different representation of those same plots. This is our spring 2021 burn. You can see our three replicated plots, um, and then within each plot, the four treatments. Um, interestingly, but intentionally, 
um, the biomass levels between our two burns are slightly different. Uh, T4, which exists as our control in both burns, is completely unmanipulated and, and unraked. However, T1, 2, and 3, which represent heavy grazing, heavy, excuse me, heavy, moderate, and light grazing in, in both burns, um, have slightly different biomass for each T1 and T2, respectively. And this is, again, intentional, intended to, as best we can, mimic reality. Um, there is typically on rangelands in springtime more biomass available than there is in the fall after a grazing season. And so we tried to match that and tried to understand how fire would behave differently under different biomass under different seasons. I have a series of images to kind of bring this to life for you all. Uh, here I am like a good range scientist kneeling on my hands and knees, clipping grass, sort of the traditional way that we might measure uh, biomass herbage uh, per acre. Um, and then Liza Johnson on her uh, trusty uh, a tractor with mower deck. Uh, Liza spent a lot of time supporting the project, um, creating both aisles so fire did not cross between treatment strips, but then actually manipulating the treatment strips themselves. Here's a little bit of Liza's handiwork. Um, early aisles being built, uh, again, so fire wouldn't cross between the treatment strips. A few days, maybe weeks later, um, of course, we not only mowed these treatment strips, but actually had to physically remove the biomass as it would be under uh, a grazing scenario. So as best we could simulating grazing. Of course, we probably picked the hottest day of the summer in 2020, a group of us going out, and this took more than just a day, um, raking these treatment strips across to prepare uh, in preparation for the burn. A few days later, um, the plot's fairly close to final completion. Um, under that sort of ominous sun that had become all too familiar in California, there were wildfires burning the northern part of the state, which gave that orange glow to our work on that particular day. Here's Mark Mays and Frank Davis uh, operating uh, a drone flight capturing the multispectral imagery. Pre-fire, uh, these flights were repeated fairly regularly. Um, it was tough to align uh, burn days with uh, pre-flight flights or pre-fire flights, um, but then again repeated post-fire. And again, um, I think has really meaningfully enriched uh, our capacity for analysis. Again, Mark Mays and um, PhD candidate Kylie Brand. Here we are creating uh, these temperature sensitive strips. So what these are are aluminum strips with temperature sensitive paints, each color. Uh, has a different melting point. And so these were placed throughout the landscape um, in anticipation of the burn. And we were able to measure the degree temperature that um, the fire got to any one point across the burn itself. Here again is Frank and Kylie placing these strips uh, here in a vertical manner to understand uh, temperature differences in the flame height itself. But most of these strips were actually placed horizontally at soil surface throughout the burn site. Vince LaRocco of Santa Barbara County Fire in a moment of levity uh, with Sam Spaulding, uh, previously mentioned, but a, a, a strong Sedgwick employee. Uh, unclear in this particular moment after a somewhat disastrous offloading of water into the pumpkin, whether, they, uh, whether there's more water in the pumpkin or on uh, Vince and Sam, but um, we got it done, so to speak. And it was a tremendous effort, no doubt, uh, both preparing the site and then actually executing the burn. And it must have been in the fog of winter that we agreed to doing it a second time, but sure enough, we did. And so here's Liza again, carving out of the hillside this last spring um, at a second location in preparation for our second burn in the spring. And then finally, some shots of the, of the spring treatment strips um, and as, as it was finalized and prepared for burning. One of the products, uh, really interesting products that was derived uh, from the drone work that Mark led uh, were these biomass maps. Again, sort of traditional range science would have you clip, you know, out of one foot, one square foot quadrat, a certain amount of biomass, weigh it and multiply it by a multiplication factor to derive um, these biomass figures, but Mark, using really high resolution imagery, 
was able to der derive what we have to imagine are significantly more precise figures to understand uh, what our pre-fire biomass levels were. And here we are, again, uh, drone image or drone video provided by Mark during the burn itself. And I've fast forwarded, if you will, to sort of an exciting moment. Uh, this is our spring, the second burn, spring 2021. But I hope that you in the audience can get a, a, a vivid sense of what it was like to actually execute the research here. Um, towards the left um, is a T4 or unmanipulated strip burning with some rather impressive flame lengths. And compare that on the right with a strip that's T3, um, which was our light grazing treatment, um, meaningfully reduced flame lengths, I might say. But you can hopefully get a sense of the operation as it unfolded and the support that we had from Santa Barbara County Fire, and as well as the numerous volunteers that came out with clip, uh, clipboards and data sheets to, to collect the data that needed to be collected. And to that end, here's an image uh, on the ground, obviously, um, but intended to illustrate um, sort of the work that we were doing. Here's Sam Spalding again in his yellow Nomex and with a camera head on, taking images every 10 meters as that flaming front aligned with T-posts, which we're now able to revisit and actually measure flame heights. Uh, Frank and Angela, Sedgwick employee, uh, obliquely uh, standing to the fire, to the flaming front with a stopwatch measuring how fast the fire was moving, uh, how long it took to pass uh, every 10 meters. Here's some images that I like uh, for two reasons. The first is I, I hope it gives you, uh, by being able to look in the foreground, a sense of what our biomass treatments look like um, from T1 through T4. Uh, so again, that would be in the upper left-hand corner, the heaviest grazing treatments, and then in the lower right-hand corner, uh, no grazing at all, so no manipulation. But then also towards the back of the plot, of course, um, you're able to see the flaming front. And so in that T4 image, you know, some rather impressive flame lengths, higher even than our T-posts that were in place to measure flame height, all the way down to in the upper left-hand corner in T1, that's fire creeping along with flame lengths that in many instances didn't uh, get any higher than a few inches in length. And then of course, some images post-fire of particular interest is just the sort of variable pattern uh, of fire and working at these really micro scales moving across the landscape. Of particular note, uh, that image in the upper left-hand corner of T1 um, that particular strip, the fire went out on its own. You might be able to see that it didn't make it all the way to the top of the treatment strip. And for me personally, that is a really important, um, important sort of data point to have been able to measure that threshold uh, of biomass of where fire will carry and won't carry seemed critical to be able to straddle. So we begin to understand um, the amount of biomass that it does take to actually carry fire, let alone sort of reduce the fire behavior. And then an image that was collected from these treatment strips post-fire of those aluminum strips that you saw earlier, uh, the paints having melted off, um, indicating how hot these fires got. Our data analysis is we're just in the middle of sort of working through um, the, the, the data that we've amassed over these last couple of months. But I did wanna share um, some preliminary results. This is a, a graph showing flame heights uh, from two burns, fall and spring. Uh, on the X or horizontal axis, you see uh, pounds of biomass from 1,000 to 4,000. And then in the vertical or Y axis, you see flame height uh, going from zero feet roughly to six feet. And uh, I hope uh, you can see a, a pattern emerging of flame heights increasing as biomass increases. Um, you also, with that dotted line, I hope that you can see um, an important threshold in the firefighting world. That's a four foot flame length threshold. And for firefighters, that's what makes the difference between being able to be on foot and directly attacking the flaming front, as opposed to if flame lengths uh, uh, rise above that, 
no longer uh, being able to work on foot and sort of narrowing options for fire suppression. Interesting, there were, interestingly, there were differences between fall and spring in terms of what the biomass level was, where the cutoff for four foot flames were. So you could have more biomass in the spring and actually have lower flame lengths than in the fall. But in general, uh, T1 and T2 plots, which were our heavy and moderately grazed plots, and you can see the sort of biomass levels here, in general, those plots all had flame lengths that uh, were lower than four feet. So what are some of the potential and anticipated outcomes of this work? I've been talking a little bit already about deriving these relationships between biomass that we manipulated and some of these important fire behavior metrics, you know, how fast the fire is moving, how high it gets. We anticipate also being able to develop relationships between fire behavior and other independent variables like slope, uh, ambient temperature, humidity, and then of course, wind speed, which is emerging to be um, an incredibly important uh, variable for some of these fire behavior metrics. Um, Robert Fitch, a PhD candidate at UCSB, is sort of leading the charge on thinking about fire impact to the rangeland soil seed bank. Um, this winter, he will have been able to complete um, growing out seeds from soil samples that were taken pre and post fire um, and grown out in a greenhouse and germination measured. But importantly, to understand how fire at these different intensities is impacting the seed bank, if at all. And then finally, and um, this is important to me, is understanding how we might derive grazing recommendations specifically to reduce wildfire impacts to human safety and to range ecology. And I'm thinking about this in, in two different ways. Um, one is to be able to um, you know, have quantitatively based recommendations, so pounds per acre that can be presented to uh, ranchers, maybe the cattle producers, for them to understand how, to what extent they need to graze down to in order for fire behavior to be meaningfully reduced or for fire to stop on their ranches completely. But then also looking at it from a different direction, um, there's a blossoming industry statewide of targeted grazers, cattle sometimes, but increasingly um, small ruminants, sheep and goats, and those uh, those operators actually get paid to graze in many instances to um, graze to reduce the threat of fire. And the, the folks who pay them to graze frequently think that um, the only way to stop or to meaningfully uh, reduce fire threat is to graze down to dirt. And um, there are a number of issues with that, of course, both the, the strain it puts on the animals themselves and the impact to the range resource. Um, and so perhaps this work and sort of the, the quantitatively driven results that we have here will be able to suggest that no, if you graze down to a more conservative level um, and still leave some amount of biomass, you're able to protect the range resource, but then also accomplish some of your goals around um, fire abatement. In my closing thoughts, I, I'd like to return to the Alisol fire because I think that um, some of the principles I've just been describing can be thoughtfully and usefully applied in a scenario like this. Clearly the area that the Alisal fire burned is incredibly complex with complex weather patterns, uh, wind events, complex topography and terrain, uh, complex patterns of land ownership, um, a lot of critical resources, the county transfer station, um, oil infrastructure, uh, a major U.S. highway uh, transportation artery in the U.S. 101. And um, we saw just a couple of weeks ago the ways in which uh, fire really threatened um, a number of the resources I just mentioned. And, um, and so as we move forward thinking about um, how grazing can contribute and be a tool in the toolbox of thinking about wildfire mitigation, we might begin to think about things like um, reintroducing grazing onto some of the state parks um, that have had grazing removed uh, for the purpose of uh, fire safety. We might think about um, how ranches that exist 
um, in the fire footprint that burned over might graze harder in certain areas at certain times of year to protect sensitive resources, um, roads, oil infrastructure, um, the county dump. Um, or we might think about hiring targeted grazers to come in here with specific grazing recommendations to be able to accomplish the same. Obviously, a point that is uh, adds to the complexity of this terrain is this distinction between grasslands and shrublands, and that's uh, not something obviously that we're able to address solely with this grassland research. But finally, I just want to um, return to something that Kate already talked about, which is um, research that I'm really excited to be a part of that's emerging at Sedgwick um, as we speak. Uh, hopefully in the fall of 2022 with, with the leadership of Frank Davis and the Lacrette Center, we will be turning our attention also to the shrubland system. So looking at uh, wildfire impacts and prescribed fire impacts to the shrubland system, specifically uh, burning this coming fall, we hope, but to institute a, a long range, long term um, research project where different units will be burned at different fire return intervals and um, there will be analysis of shrubland recovery and, and associated changes. Um, I would like very much, if possible, to be able to add a layer of grazing here to understand um, what is sure to be the sort of complex um, interplay of grazing and fire and shrubland recovery. And so with that, I'll return to a favorite image of mine of Kate and Liza uh, assisting me um, on the reserve, again, um, I just want to thank and, and show appreciation for the sort of resources that um, Cedric Reserve has been able to marshal in um, pursuit of the research that I've just described. Um, I hope I've left enough time for questions. Um, and if I haven't, or if there are questions we don't get to, there is my name, but more importantly, and my email address there uh, for you to reach out to me should you want to. So with that, I'll turn it back to Marianne. And Hopefully answer some questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Matthew. That was a very, very interesting presentation. And I, I'm I'm just shocked that um, you know, studies of this nature ha have really not been done and have been a really long time since the last study was done. So I want to just thank you for this important research, which I think is really important for the state of California and for all of us. Um, I'm gonna dig right into the Q&A. We've got so many questions and it looks like all of you out there in the audience are just really aware of your environment and have good ones. So let me, let me just get right to it. So first, Matthew, um, this is a question from Susan King. And Susan asks, are these grasslands or pastures native grasses or invasive? And she's remarking that they're very different. So could you, could you talk a little bit about the native versus non-native um, aspect of the grass? Yeah, I mean, the simple answer is that the grasslands that we examined at Cedric Reserve are largely non-native naturalized annual grass species. So um, there was some, but very limited um, native perennial grass presence. And that was okay in my mind and estimation because the vast majority of grasslands in California are invaded. Um, and so, you know, Cedric Reserve is representative of grasslands across the state as a whole. Um, now, the, and I didn't mention this, but the soil seed bank work that Robert Fitch is doing um, uh, with the assistance of Carla D'Antonio, you know, the, the lens through which they're looking at that is with a mind to think about how fire might be used in restoration techniques, specifically perhaps to target and um, sort of negatively impact those Eurasian non-native species and to help promote native grass species. Um, but the grasslands themselves that we burned were not native. Okay. Um, this next question is um, from Dominique Moni. Um, and Dominique asks, why use a mower rather than live cattle to reduce the biomass in the experimental plots? And she asks, would the additional processes that live cattle impose, disturbance from hooves, nutrient impacts, impact biomass or diversity of fuels? Yeah, all really excellent questions. And my back uh, probably had the same question for me after days and days of raking. <laughs> um, most simply put, it, it, we in this sort of experimental context, 
at the scale that we were working, it would have just been unfeasible to work with livestock of whatever size. I mean, sheep and goat um, with electric nets may, you know, would have been more realistic, but um, we were looking for such precision in the biomass levels and we were working, you know, yes, at larger scales, but not very big scales. Um, it was uh, almost inconceivable to imagine using livestock. With that, and and also, you know, in the experimental context, it, it we we strove as best we could to achieve a certain kind of uniformity in the biomass levels. And I know that that's not representative necessarily of the sort of micro structural heterogeneity of grasslands, especially grasslands that have been grazed. But um, again, in the sort of experimental context, for the purposes of analysis, that was a goal of ours. With that said, one of the really interesting insights for me as working as a researcher was um, we were going, we were shooting for uniformity. And even with that as, as an explicit goal, to, we, we spent just a ton of time looking at this really small scale. And, and I came to appreciate just how heterogeneous the, you know, these grasslands are, even when we're trying to achieve a single biomass figure. And so, you know, I think that that was vividly portrayed in that image of sort of the, the meandering fire. Um, but, you know, I, I can't speak to some, some of the details that were asked about um, fertility, I think, and the sort of unevenness of grazing, for sure, that, that impacts fire. There's work, uh, Sam Fullendorf out of the Southwest has looked at um, sort of the uneven patchiness of fire and grazing at different scales in a really interesting way, but that wasn't sort of what we were looking at in this particular context. Uh, this next question is from Scott Cooper, <clears throat> and Scott asks, at a different, at a given grazing intensity, could you discuss the effects of different livestock species, sheep versus goats versus cattle, on plant species composition and biomass? Yeah, really good, complex question. I don't know that I can, quite honestly. I mean, in these grasslands, I don't think that um, the grazing habits of those different species would make a meaningful impact. I mean, in sort of range science 101, we learn that, you know, those different species prefer different sorts of feed, cattle typically more grass, whereas goats are maybe more browsers, sheep maybe forbs over grasses. Perhaps that would have uh, had some impact on um, fire behavior, but uh, largely speaking, you know, this was mostly grasslands that we were talking about, and I don't think that in that context, the different grazing species would have much, uh, would have much of a, an impact on fire behavior itself. Yep, great. Okay, so this next question is from Judy Stopper, and Judy asks, does air moisture content affect the effectiveness of each burn treatment variation? So, what I understand that question to be asking about is maybe relative humidity um, as a measure of the uh, moisture and air. And for sure, um, there were differences in relative humidity between our different burn days, although we were generally in uh, uh, the same ballpark or in the 30s, if you will, 30% are, are relative humidity. Um, you know, and this is a, a kind of complicated point that I didn't make, but of course, you know, we're talking, these are prescribed fires and I've been talking about characterizing wildfire and those two things are not necessarily analogous. Prescribed fire sort of by definition it only happens out of wildfire conditions. And so typically with higher relative humidities and lower ambient temperatures. And so we have to imagine that in a true wildfire context with some of the fire behavior that we were witnessing, at these biomass levels would have been more extreme, um, but that's work that we have to do um, kind of unpacking some of the results. Okay, and one last question, because there's a couple folks that had a similar, similar style question. Um, and this is, how do you think your research findings can be used to inform a more comprehensive or complementary fire management plan that mitigates fuels across a large and varied geographic areas in the state, uh, you know, forests, grasslands, suburban neighborhoods, and so on. There's a couple of questions just about how does this, how does your experiment kind of scale up? Yeah, I, I don't, 
That's a good question. I don't know if we'd be able to answer in less than a minute, but you know, the first thing that comes to mind is, and this is a point I frequently make, is that in sort of traditional ranching operations, typically cattle in California, uh, ranchers graze on the whole pretty conservatively. And that's because the biomass that's grown as forage in the spring needs to last them well into the following winter. And so in many instances, a lot of the pastures that are around the state are sort of undergrazed in the context of fire. And um, there's something called the residual dry matter guidelines that were developed by the UC. And what they are is basically the UC saying that you can graze down to this level and still not negatively impact the range resource or next year's forage production. Um, and they are minimum guidelines. And interestingly, there are there is no maximum guideline. And there's a lot of talk statewide about um, using sort of the data like we've produced here at Sedgwick to actually create an upper limit mm -hmm. and strong suggestions and, and having ha and numerical recommendations around um, if you are concerned or thinking about fire, um, you ought to graze down to at least this level um, to really meaningfully mitigate um, fire threat. And undoubtedly it's impossible to accomplish those grazing levels across all grasslands or rangelands around the state. And so the next step would then be, um, you know, land managers and livestock operators and municipalities thinking about where are the critical areas in their communities or on their ranches where, uh, where grazing should be targeted first and earlier in the season to make sure you get down to those biomass levels. Well, it seems like a lot more research needs to get done. Uh, we'll wrap it up here. And Matthew, uh, thank you very much for that very interesting talk. Um, again, I'm sorry to the audience. We had so many Q&A questions and we couldn't get to them all today. Um, please join us next week for number six of seven in our webinar series. Um, next week will be hosted by Santa Cruz Island Reserve. And we will hear from Christina Soto Balderas of the UCSB Office of Education Partnerships. Who will, who will present the UCSB Smithsonian Scholars Program, training the next generation of Santa Cruz Island researchers. So we're, we're in for a treat again next week as well. I just wanna say thank you and good evening every night. Good evening, everybody. And I hope you have a great night. Thank you.